message this morning is scratch and dent, and it is a, it's one of these types of messages. I think it's, it, it, I know it's going to hit home. It hit home for, it hit home for me. It, it's something that me personally, um, you know, I focus in on things I shouldn't focus in on. I get consumed with things I shouldn't be consumed with, and, and this is what that message is all about. I want you to go to the next step. So, if you are a yard seller, I don't know what the term is. If you like going around to yard sales all day long on a Saturday, there's some there's a term for that of some sort. I'm not for sure, but 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 you know what a scratch and dent item is all about. And there's something special about a scratch and dent item because it still functions properly. It just doesn't look properly, um, but it it still works. And uh, that's a that's a big part of a Christian, you know. If, if you were to dive into the Word and you were to look up different, uh, different characters within the Bible, different men and women, rarely do you find a description of what they look like. We see Esau. We know he was hairy. Uh, we assume the smelly factor's there. We think that he has some red hair of sorts. But technically, if you look into the Old Testament at that time, they didn't have words to describe color to its fullest. So we don't see a lot of color terms. So we kind of assume and, and, and you know, we, we make assumptions. But uh, you'll notice also, if you see David and Goliath, we know one was tall, one was small. We know that, you know, David was good looking a little bit. We, he wasn't quite like his other brothers. And we see little terms. We don't know exactly what they look like. That wasn't something that, that God was concerned about. We know that Samson had long hair, that's about it, but I like to imagine him having really long hair and really skinny arms. I like to think of him as a small, scrawny dude and really long hair. That's, that's why I like As a lot of us think of Fabio, but that's not the case, okay? Uh, I, I highly doubt that he was that ripped because we know that, enta- that, that entails enhancement properties. Dennis will tell you all about those things. They, those are, that's called needle in your buttocks. So... <laughs> So that's just not possible. But, but I, I promise you that it, it's not something God is concerned with. God's not worried about the looks of things. God's concerned about what's on the inside. So uh, I'm going to open up the Bibles to this morning to, to discuss one individual that I absolutely love. He's my favorite guy in the Bible. Some of you will go, James. No, I know a lot of times I'll talk about James. James is my favorite book in the Bible, and James I can relate to. However, Stephen is by far the man that I look at as, as, a, as a role model, and he is by far the best character in the Bible if, for me. So Stephen, so we see him in, in, in the book of Acts, and I'll paraphrase some stuff just to get us ready, and then we'll dive into the scriptures completely. But um, Acts, uh, it, it's great because it's the beginning of the church, and it's talking about the, the glory and about the Holy Spirit coming in and doing miraculous things. I mean, not just things. That's kind of like a horrible term to use as things. But the Holy Spirit was doing works, mighty works, in, in, in and through the people. And that's what was amazing. And it's not something that was just for them. It's for us today. But there was this, there's a, a moment where the church was growing so rapidly that it became overwhelming. Not every job could function properly because there wasn't enough people that was deemed to do certain things. There was no task involved to say, all right, these people do this. So it got over, overwhelming, and they decided, hey, the widows, they aren't getting fed. The children, no one's getting fed properly and being taken care of, and we need to decide who. Well, in deciding who, they picked out seven individuals, and one of those was Stephen. And in the description of Stephen, they said this was a man full of faith. A man full of faith. And, and that's something pretty neat to hear. He's full of faith, and he's full of the Holy Spirit. But what's wild is, is it was full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. That was his requirement. That's what all these men, the, the men who were chosen, that's what their requirement was to distribute food. The requirement to distribute food. Many times we just go, anyone can, right? I mean, how often do we say that with people who, who, uh, who don't have a job? You know, the, the meanness, the words that come out of us when we see someone on the side of the street, you heard this forever and ever, someone with a sign who is struggling and bad, what do we say to them? Why don't you just get a job at McDonald's? How nice, right, that we say those types of words? 
But we say those things in essence of saying, come on, anyone can hand out food. Well, according to the Bible, not just anyone could. The people that could hand out food were the ones that were full of faith, the ones that are full of the Holy Spirit. Someone that was worthy to do such a task. But now on top of this, it wasn't like these guys were like, oh gosh, that's it? <laughs> if you were to read on, you would learn very quickly that these men weren't just handing out food, but they were also doing the works of the kingdom. They were going out and they were, they were performing the signs, the miracles, and the wonders. They were doing some great stuff. It goes on to even explain that Stephen was full of the power of God. That power we know now is just another term for the Holy Spirit, being full of the Holy Spirit. Because this is our requirement to do the works of God, to be full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. And guys, what's amazing is as you continue to keep reading, they didn't like Stephen because of these a attributes to his character. Full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. They didn't know it. They knew that he was a dangerous, dangerous individual. So what happened was they decided to, to, to put some snares in his path and to lie and to catch him in, in, in any way, shape, or form. And they couldn't catch him, so they made up these lies. And these lies were that he was talking bad about Moses, talking bad about, you know, God himself. So when they brought him up to the council, and they brought him into this arena of sorts, a temple. I mean, this was definitely back then before we see our arenas, our, our, our temples now, our churches. The temple of, of that day when Jesus Christ had passed, it became an arena. An arena who was right, who was wrong, and... So they were accusing him. The Jews were accusing Stephen. And what they said was, well, Stephen, you're, what do you have to say about yourself? <laughs> then we see another description of what Stephen looks like. And that description was, was he had the, the face of an angel. The face of an angel sitting there, innocent, right? Just glowing. That, you know that aggravated these Pharisees and these Jews even more. That after they accused him, he's kind of like, <laughs> all right, you know. No big deal. You ain't going to hurt me. I could care less. That's pretty cool, you know. So he goes on. And they say, hey, what do you got to say? And he says, well, all right. I'll give you a history lesson. Because you think that I'm saying something negative and bad about Moses and our, our forefathers and about the greatness that happened in the Old Testament, let me give you a history lesson. So he starts off with Abraham and starts explaining the story of Abraham and Joseph. What he's doing is, is he's pointing, because the Old Testament points to the New Testament. The old, and, the, and the New Testament confirms the Old Testament. So in this moment, um, he gives this whole history lesson. And interweaved in all of these stories is the power and the promise of God sending his son so that we could be saved. And that's what, that was Stephen's main motive. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach him the word. And I'm going to show them what's, a, what's about, you know, what's happening and what's about to take place if they would just receive and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and personal Savior. But at the very end, Stephen got real. He got really, really real. And it goes to the scriptures of even Paul talking to Timothy and saying, hey, Timothy, write in there. I want, or, well, teach this. I'm writing it. But teach this, that, that you use the word. To, to rebuke and to correct and to straighten out those that are, are, are being tossed to and fro. Use that word to, to encounter them so that they can have that, that perfect relationship. So, so Stephen, at the very end of it all, goes, you stiff-necked people. And he, he corrects them all. He said, listen, you rejected your Savior, the one that all of these prophets are pointing to. Everyone. It's so plain and simple if you just see it. Just, just, just acknowledge the fact that this man that came, he was truly the Son of God. It was too hard for him. And, and I know some of us in this room was like, yeah, it was, a bunch of dummies. <laughs> the bottom line is, is that I know some of you, even today, are dealing with this. Even today you're sitting here and you're focused on so many other th the, the world has for you and you can't, you can't fathom that thought of Jesus being that Savior. And, you're, you're, and you try to wrap your head around it and it becomes a little difficult. Some of you that are really strong Christians and you're like, yeah, I can't. You, you call out the Pharisees to just being silly and they not know that God was Him. But 
you know, the, the, I, it's hard. It is a moment. But it's, it's easy when you say, you know what? I'm going to focus. And that's the problem with, with us as Christians and those that in, in this world, of our, our attention is put in, in on so many ridiculous things that, that we cannot. And for some reason, it's like ordering ordering our, our path and ordering our steps. We, we put it in, in this crazy stance of what's important and what's not, and, and we say, oh, the, you know, um, uh, God's important. We say God's important, but actually he's not. The video game on our phone that we spend hours upon hours playing is more important. <laughs> and it happens. Our social media time, our television time, our days of rest, we put all of these things out of whack and out of order. And then when we get to this point of kind of like, yeah, you know, I don't feel God very much. And, 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 you're, and yeah, you'll still crucify the Pharisees. You'll still crucify them and be kind of like, well, they were dumb. How could they not see it? It's kind of evident right there. But they were out of whack and out of order as well. You just happen to know a little bit more of the story nowadays. You have a, a little bit clearer understanding because we do have the whole New Testament but the true understanding, even besides having the Word, is having the Holy Spirit inside of you. And how does that happen? Is putting God first and getting everything properly in order and filling yourself up with the Holy Spirit, filling yourself up with that of faith, building that faith to the point where, where it's like, this is a no-brainer. I know that God's real. Because see, what happens next with Stephen is, is he was in order. He had it all together and and when he calls out the stiff-necked people and he explains to them that they are completely backwards, they're completely wrong, they ask him, what do you have to say for yourself with all this? I can't believe we're going to stone you. And he's like, man, go ahead. I see God, I see Jesus on the throne right now in heaven. You're not going to affect me. You're not going to deter me from doing what I'm supposed to be doing. So what do they do? They drag him out. So we see this in Acts chapter 7. And we'll start here in, in verse uh, 58. So they rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young, na young man named Saul. We know he eventually comes to be known as Paul. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit he fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with the sin. And with that, he died. Guys, I didn't hear in there. As they stoned him, Stephen yelled out, ouch. Stephen yelled out, oh, please stop, that hurts. He didn't. He yelled out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with the sin. And with that, he died. Have you noticed behind me, I have a car hood. Some of you are like, wow, it's a pretty car hood. It is. It's got a lot of scratches and dents on it. It's, um, it's a pretty one. I got it from Stephen and Nick. They work at a uh, body shop. And uh, I asked them, I said, hey, I need a car hood. They obviously wanted to know why. Uh, <laughs> I told them, just bring it. Don't ask questions. <laughs> so they brought me my car hood here. I'm not quite sure what it was from, but I do know this. It had to be foreign. Because I could do this right here with no problem whatsoever. <laughs> it's not made out of American steel. But I do know that it is probably a gas saving type of vehicle because it's the size of my arm. It's, and it doesn't weigh a, anything at all. But if you notice, it's got a big dent. It's got some scratches. It's got some, some issues. I like the obvious that it's red. Someone decided to write that on the hood. Red. It's good. I'm glad. I do not colorblind. Do you have colorblind people that work at the body shop, Stephen? Okay. Um, I'm just thinking, it's kind of like our painter, he's colorblind. <laughs> like, don't take your car to his auto body shop. <laughs> I'm kidding. So, uh, so you look at this, and you see all the scratches and all the dents. And you can be focused in on these scratches. So if we just kind of focus in on this little area right here, it's like, oh, there's a scratch, you know. Some of us relate to this, and that's, that's when you buy a new car. I remember buying my first car. I was uh, just right out of uh, 
No, actually, I was in college when I first bought, uh, I bought my first car, and it was beautiful. It was, this red, it was this red car. I mean, I was so excited. It was a lot of money, and I was paying for it myself without my family helping. I was like, this is awesome. And I remember taking it, parking in the parking lot, coming back, and sure enough, there it was in the side of the car door. Someone dinged it. Oh, man, I was so devastated because I bought it. It was my car. It's like, what in the world is wrong with these people? No car around it anymore. I thought, oh, they didn't even leave their number. It was frustrating. So what do you want to do when you see that scratch? You want to tell all your friends about it. They're about to get in the car. It's on their side of the car. And you're like, hey, see that scratch? You moron. Scratched me. You want to point it out. You want to excuse it. I'm so sorry. My car's not perfect anymore. Before you know it, then you get your second scratch. Like right there. And then you're like, Man, my second scratch. So the car names start changing rapidly. So if you named your car like Betty, like this is Betty. When you first get it, you name it Susan. You name it something. You girls, I don't know if you name your cars, but as guys we do. But eventually if you get so many dings and scratches on it, what do you end up calling it? You call it Tank. <laughs> so, so my car currently, the Tahoe, is our Tank. It's our Tank car. I don't care what happens to it anymore on the outside. It doesn't bother me one bit. It's a Tank. I got broken mirrors, broken everything on it. My gas, my gas can lid is dented in. I mean, how does that happen? <laughs> everything is dented on it. Now, granted, I still, if my children are, are climbing on it, I'm obviously like, what are you doing? You get off my tank. <laughs> you know, I've seen them. Nothing's worse than your, your car's dirty, all dusty, and your kid takes their fingers and starts rubbing their name on the side of it. <laughs> I know. I know you've done it. (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) But the scratches and dents, we can get focused on these things so easily, and we start focusing on them so much that it causes us at times to quit. It causes us to just give up. So let me explain something about this, this car hood. As Christians... We can, get, we can get into a place where we go, that dent hurt. And we want to tell everyone about this dent. And it, like it stops us in our tracks. Like it, we don't want to move forward anymore. It stops us. We go, we, we're done, we're done. I may have told you the story once before, but I was out at an IHOP one time with some, some pastor friends and evangelists. And with evangelists are, I, one day I, I'd like to be an evangelist. Some of you are like, why? Because you don't deal with people at all. <laughs> you show up like a rock star, preach, and then you leave. That's how evangelists do. <laughs> Amen, Bishop, you know. <laughs> Bishop Miles. <laughs> like, that's right. Man, I tell you what. So, you know, what's funny is, is that I was out there at that restaurant, and the evangelist says, hey, pastors, I want to know your stories. Come on, man, let me tell you your stories. You guys got funny stories. So my friend, Pastor David Gray, he, he starts talking about one of his funny stories. And he says, oh, you guys don't want to know my stories. You, you want to ask Josh here. They call me Hammy. They say, hey, you want to know Hammy's stories. Hammy's stories, they're funny. So it was late at night, and I just started crying. That was a, a complete buzzkill to the IHOP extravaganza. <laughs> I started crying, and I said, guys, I don't want to talk about my dents and scratches. I want to talk about the miracles and the signs and wonders. I want to hear about the salvations that are taking place in your life. Like, I want to know about all the good things that are taking, like, that are going on in your church. Like, I don't want to hear about all this anymore. Because it's frustrating. It's these things right here that puts us in our track, or stops us in our tracks where we go, I don't want to move anymore. And all we want to do is just put all the attention on all these different things and to say, yeah, I, that's me, that's who I am. Some of you, I, this goes against about what I'm, what I'm, what I'm preaching today, but I'll, sh- I'll share with you a good example of what I'm talking about. Years ago, I received a letter here at the church. It was a 15-page handwritten letter, front-to-back college rule. It was all down even to the miniature small words on the bottom, and it even had an arrow to tell you to turn over <laughs> 
I wouldn't have thought twice about the letter. I probably would have just ripped it up, thrown it away, but it, but it came with a voicemail on the answering machine at the church spewing all kinds of craziness. And I thought, oh, man, this is not good, you know. Like, what in the world? I didn't even know this guy. This guy showed up one Sunday, and then a couple weeks late, later to a few months later, we received all of this. I didn't do anything to him. Um, it was actually to, to something else. It didn't even relate to me. I had nothing involved in this. But it was just a hatred towards the church in general. Churches everywhere. So uh, I didn't want to read it. So I had Adam read it, our connections pastor. <laughs> said, you read the letter. So he read the letter. And I said, what do you think we should do? He said, uh, we should call the cops. I said, all right, let's call, let's call the cops. So we called the grand police and had them come down and file a report. So when the officer came in, he asked me all the questions, and so I let him listen to the voicemail, and then he, uh, he said, you read the letter? I said, no, nah, brother, I don't want to read that letter. He said, okay, I'll read it. So it took him like 30 to 40-some minutes to read this letter. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. This was due to the fact of how small it was, how long it was, 15-page, handwritten, front and back, college rule, squished down at the bottom with arrows. Okay, imagine the very end of the letter, the, the police officer looked up at me and he said, Hey, you own a gun? <laughs> I do own a gun. He goes, You know how to use the gun? I said, I'm from West by God, Virginia. <laughs> I said, Yeah, I know how to work that gun. He goes, Do you feel like you can protect your family? And I said, Yeah, I do believe. And he goes, Okay. He goes, I'm going to go down there, and I'm going to issue a restraining order, and I'll take care of it, and so you let me know if anything changes. I said, all right, brother. See, we can focus in on this dent. See, something like that could put a stop us in our tracks. That could easily just look at my wife and I. We could be like, that was a dent. This, this stinks. Let's go tell everyone about it. Let's cry a little bit about how it hurts. They didn't like me, and they wanted to kill me. Let's just move. Let's move. I mean, let's get honest. In, in the retrospect of everything, my wife and I, now, not her, she, this, and this is not an agreement to our marriage, but if it was up to me, I would live at the Grand Canyon, and I think you all would attest to that as well. So for me, I'd just move. I'd just move to the Grand Canyon. I'll become a ranger. <laughs> now, my wonderful in-laws that are visiting today, which, by the way, these are our pastors, Bonnie and, and, and Pastor Daryl Huffman, which we love dearly. They support our church greatly. They helped us start this beast, but um, they, would, they would actually encourage at this moment that, I would, that my wife would divorce me if I moved them to the Grand Canyon. <laughs> so I know we're not in agreement, so don't worry, we will not move to the Grand Canyon until our children are out of high school. <laughs> but these are the types of things that would make you just want to stop. I don't want to focus on that stuff. What I want to focus in on are the good things that happen, the miraculous signs and wonders that take place, and the life-changing events. Because for one, this is absolutely, absolutely the truth, is that Jesus isn't, he doesn't care about our scratches and dents. He cares about our differences, the differences that make us and set us apart from this world. That's what Jesus is concerned about. He's our healer. When he sees these scratches and dents, he's kind of like, all right. I'll fix that. That's not a problem. He's not concerned about how deep the wound is because he's like, all right, come to me. I'll fix it. You, I told you these things. Come to me. Present your requests. If you're heavy burden, set it down at my feet. I'll take them. God wants this. He wants us to come to him in those moments. But he's not concerned about these scratch and dents because he can heal them. What he's concerned about is the differences that we're making in this world. So this leads me to something I want to celebrate. So on Thursday night of our men's conference, there was a, uh, an individual who was avoiding me. And not on purpose, but he didn't know how to approach me at times. He was kind of like, oh, I saw him in the distance every so often come and look at me. And then I was talking to someone, and then he would kind of avoid me. I was outside underneath the drive area, and I was talking to one of the men at the conference, and we were just having a good time. And he came outside, and he kind of, I saw him in the distance, but I couldn't like stop. In the conversation, I didn't want to be rude and be like, hey, man, you need me, but I just let him go, but I knew there was something. What was funny about it was this was Tony, and what's funny about Tony is he's like a man of respect in a sense of, I'm not going to bug you, but what was hilarious was that he, was, he knew 
that God was all over him and that he had to make a difference. So instead of just being rude at there, he decided to pull up with his car, honk the horn, and say, Hey, Pastor Josh! <laughs> Which was hilarious. Because that, shares, that shows me really quickly that he couldn't leave this parking lot because God was telling him so greatly to share his story with the men that he knew that if he went off that parking lot that he would be making a mistake. So he yells at me, Pastor Josh, come here. Hey, man, uh, so you said that a few guys are going to share the story at church. He said, can I share my story? Now, I know Tony. I know Tony very well. I've known him for years now, and I would trust him up here at the pulpit. And I've, I've noticed, obviously, in his own life, some of the things that he actually revealed to us on Friday night. I said, Tony, absolutely, man. You can have the microphone. I said, you know, this is, this is how it's going to work. Just come up and do it. And he did it. And let me tell you something. He did a phenomenal job. He shared his heart. And the men of the conference, I know you received it. And I'll prove this. And this is not a, this is not a moment to say, hey, Tony, you know, boast up a little bit. But I want to I wanna share with Tony that the truth of, of him being obedient to God's word. So the men that were here, how, how, on, be honest. If you're like, I only got stuff out of Ronnie, that's cool. Just whatever. But if you guys, if you guys got something from Tony, raise your hand right now. That's every man that was here in this, at the men's conference, Tony. Every guy here. Because you were obedient to God's word. It was amazing, wasn't it, guys? I mean, it was good. His word was amazing. Because you know why it was amazing? Because when he stood up here and he started talking, now he mentioned some scratches and some dents, but he didn't focus on this, did he? He started talking about how God healed him, and how God was moving, and how God is instructing and pushing him forward. He could have easily got up here and be like, yeah, man, God's life stinks. Good luck. But he didn't, did he? He said, you know what? Life happened. Some issues in my life and, and circumstances, but you know what? God is bringing me out of it. God is doing these things. Because see, what happened, what's funny is, is, see, we can go to the body shop and some people can be like, I got a ding in my door, will you fix it? And be a few hundred dollars. So I could go to Stephen, and I could say, hey, Stephen, my tank, man, I need to get it cosmetically fixed. I said, how much is it going to cost? It'll be like eight grand. I'll go, what? <laughs> it's going to cost you about $8,000 to fix your Tahoe. And I'll be like, well, that's not, I don't know if I want to do that. So Stephen and I will discuss it. He'll say, well, Josh, do you think that your tank will get you from point A to point B, even if your hood's all dinged up? And I'll go, Yep. Do you think that, um, does your engine look good on the inside? I'll say, yep. He said, well, then why do you need to get your car fixed? Your car is fixed. It's just those dings and scratches that make it, you know, stick out like a sore thumb. But other than that, why are you worried? It's still moving, isn't it? Yeah, it's moving great. Well, is it worth $8,000? No. Well, then keep Keep moving. Don't let these things stop you in your track because God knows that if I spent $8,000 on my car, I wouldn't have any money for gas to drive it. <laughs> it would just look pretty in my driveway. So you guys, if we're doing God's work, what happens is scratches and dents are going to come. And those moments are going to be overwhelming and they will consume us, but we have the choice to say, you know what? I like them. You know, it's like, I like scratches and dents. These are awesome. Like, this is great because it's a point of, this is Scripture. James chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Count it all joy when tests and, and trials come your way. Because at this moment, if you lack wisdom, because at that moment when I got that ding, I thought, God, how do I handle this? How do I handle this ding? I lack some wisdom in this moment. And I got this scratch over here. I go, man, I lack some patience. All of these issues come in our life, and then we kind of go, man, God, how do I fix this? God fixes them. And that's a beautiful part about being scratched and dented. Because you know that you're doing the work of God. God's called us to do a great, miraculous thing. But what matters is what's on the inside. What matters is what's going on. As you can get dents and scratches, how you continue to keep striving forward is that you continue to keep building your faith on the Word of God. You keep applying it to your circumstances and your situations. 
You, you set up a life full of righteousness. You say, God, I want a lifestyle that's pleasing to you. We see some scriptures in 2 Timothy chapter 2 where Paul is writing to Timothy and he's spurring him forward. And I love these scriptures. If you, if you have time this week, and you should make time, make this a priority. But open up your word and study both letters to Timothy. These are great for us to strengthen ourselves so that we can continue to keep doing the work that he's called us to do. There's a moment where he even tells Timothy, he said, hey, don't let anyone hurt you because you're young. Nothing's more frustrating. And I know some of you, some, I, I, even I mean, the Evans in the room and the Joshua's in the room, these guys, the younger, the younger guys, you know, and Shelby, some of the younger girls in the room. It's like, for some reason, when you have a piece of wisdom that's really good and it's full of the Word of God and a piece of, of truth of God being there, what's cool is, is that God, God will use you, but then the enemy, man, the, God, the enemy will say, uh, let me remind them how young they are and how they really don't know what they're talking about. And so Paul says, and says hey, don't let anyone, you know, take advantage of your youth. Don't let anyone be like, well, he's just a young whippersnapper, you know, you're, a, you're called by God. It's, it's awesome that you have the ability to use the Word and, and, and then change. It doesn't matter what the demographic is, the age. It doesn't matter. A youth can actually teach. A youth can learn. But, but a youth can teach the wisdom of God. It doesn't matter your age. Isn't that great? Isn't that awesome that Kelly... Guess what, Kelly? Guess what? You're never going to be good enough to teach anyone until you're 50. Good luck. That would stink. That would be horrible. I'd be like, no one's ever good enough. Jake, you're never good enough, man. Not until you like, turn like 40. Then you're good enough. That's sad. That's sad. We actually know, uh, some scholars believe that Peter was like 21. Peter's 21 and hanging out with Jesus. And he addresses the multitudes. And he tells them, says, hey, hey guys, um, let me explain what's happening here. The Holy Spirit's come and has filled us up. We're not drunk. We're not speaking a weird language. We're speaking a holy language. We're speaking something that's awesome. And let me explain something to you about it. And he addresses the crowd to such a degree that the Holy Spirit uses him so that the heartstrings of the people turn towards the face of God and said, I want more of this. And from that moment, the church increased. And the church continued to develop and grow. It was awesome. It was a miraculous moment. So no matter how old you are, you have the ability to share the gospel. It's truth. As long as you are full of faith in the Holy Spirit. There's nothing there's not a cap on this. There's not a limitation. There's not a, a standard of saying it's only for certain people. It's for everyone. Stephen is an example for all of us to follow that it's not the scratches and dents. It's what's inside. Let those scratches and dents push us towards God so that we can make the difference that he's calling us to make. So when we see second, in, in 2 Timothy, and let me say something. Even if you were to open up uh, uh, 2 Timothy here, uh, in, in chapter 2 and in verse 16, I believe, it says this, Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Here we are. Godless chatter is this. I'm hurting so bad. I'm hurting. When you continue to keep, I'm hurting. It's hurt. This was painful. This is not, this is not... This is just, I just can't go anymore. That's godless chatter. You'll say, how's that godless chatter? It's godless chatter because God says that we are a healed nation. That we are those that are powerful because we have a name that we can call upon. The name of Jesus. So it's ungodly when we start calling out all of these things and say, we just can't do it. He's not telling us to do that. You know, what's funny is that when you start reading a lot of these stories that Paul tells us about, yeah, he makes a comment about how rough it was. I mean, I was beaten, I was destroyed, but let me tell you something. I got out of jail. You start hearing all this stuff. You don't hear about how many lashes and how many, how many scars and marks. You don't, you don't hear about how many days some of them were in jail. Somebody's like, I was in jail. 
God knows some of them were in there for a really long time. They didn't focus on that. What they did focus on was like, all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, this angel came. It was kind of weird. I didn't know if it was a vision or not. And then all of a sudden, I was outside of the jail. It was crazy. He goes over to a door, knocks on this door. This girl answers it and actually doesn't even open up the door for Peter. Just leaves the door shut and runs back in and goes, you guys won't believe this, but I think Peter's outside. I like how her name's mentioned in the Bible for her airheadedness. Bless her heart. I'm sure she got to heaven and was kind of like, what in the world? You know? I was a part of the church too. Don't make me look like a moron. Left Peter outside. But guys, here we have an opportunity to speak the truth and to speak the goodness. Let's not speak the sad and the worries. That's ungodly. It's ungodly chatter. But one thing we see, we see it in Acts or in in uh, in Second Timothy, chapter two, verse twenty. It says, "But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also utensils of wood and earthenware, and some for honorable and noble use, and some for menial and, 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 and ignoble use. So whoever cleanses himself from what is ignoble and unclean." who separates himself from contact with contaminating and corrupting influences, will then himself be a vessel set apart and useful for honorable and noble purposes, consecrated and profitable to the master, fit and ready for any good work. Shun youthful lusts and flee from them and aim at and pursue righteousness, all that is virtuous and good, right living, conformity to the will of God in thought, word, and deed. And aim at and pursue faith, love, and peace, harmony, and concord with others, and fellowship with all Christians who call upon the Lord out of a pure heart. God, set ourselves apart. Be something that's good. My last and final approach with this message this morning is we've got to stop being church police at times. We've got to stop being the people police at times. We've got to stop this nonsense. It's like when we have an issue with a, a problem with something, it's like we want to go and, and make a picket sign, and we want to go and put it in front of someone's face, and we want to be like, you know, a distraction, distraction. If you were to take all of that effort and put it on the difference of doing what God's called you to do, of being and doing the good, What's happening is, is you actually free up that distraction from those that are also trying to do and make the difference to this world. We have folks that want to get on litigation of, of, of fighting and, and, and want to set up um, crazy doctrinal things that aren't even doctrinal, it's just religious. And we allow that stuff to negate us from the promises of God. It, allow, it, it allows the, the enemy to come in and separate but if we would get true in the fact that God just, God just wants us to be obedient. God wants us to hear His Word. If we would get focused in on the goodness of what God's doing and, and what God can do through you. See, that's the problem with, you know, Stephen here. Stephen, he's like appointed because he was full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. He was appointed to hand out food. Many of us are kind of like, I don't want to hand out food. I want something more important. I don't want to make coffee. I don't want to watch kids and change diapers. I don't want to be a parking lot attendant. Some of you don't even do anything at all. Some of you are like, I don't want to do nothing. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to make a mistake. I want to keep my, my pretty looks. Some of you need scratches and dents, man. Some of you need this stuff so you can lean on God and that you can pursue this stuff. You can say, you know what, I'm making a difference. I see the difference that's taking place. I will, I will not be focused on these things. You know, in 1 Thessalonians, we see this in chapter 5, verse 11. It says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. He gives, he gives some, some accommodations to the Thessalonians and saying, Hey, hey, you guys are doing great. Keep doing it. Keep building one another up. Let's not pull each other down. Because as Christians, we're called to do some great things. 
The sad part about it is, as many of us in this room, we won't, ex- we won't accept the fact that, you, that you'll never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. And I hate that it gets to that point in our lives sometimes. It's kind of like everything has just fallen to shambles and all you have is Jesus. Don't let it get to that point. Let this be that benchmark moment that changes everything, the milestone where you look back and you go, this is that opportunity to not have to get to a place of of complete nothing. Sometimes it happens. But guys, I promise you this, Jesus is there. Jesus is right there. He's pursuing you passionately so that that you can make that difference. He's setting you up, man. He's giving you the tools you need. All you have to do is set everything in order properly to how God has arranged it. He's first. He's first. We use this example time and time again. Churches all over this United States and all over the world are using this example this morning. Are you spending more time with God or are you spending more time with the world? Are you spending more time? I mean, what is it? What is it? My wife and I, we had lunch this past week with, with Reverend Reinhard Bonnke, and, and he said my wife asked him a question, and it was actually he answered it the wrong way. It's one of the questions you actually asked, but the question was, was how, how long are the crusades going to last? What's funny was my wife was thinking, how many, how many years are you going to do these crusades through America? And, and Reverend Bonnke didn't hear that because Reverend Bonnke doesn't care if it's 100 years more, we're going to continue to keep doing these crusades. His thing was, well, the crusade's only two days, but I'd really need five. <laughs> That's what he said to Anna's question. Well, I really need five days, but we've, we've put it down to two. There's like an attention span with us that we can only go two. See, in Africa, when they would do these crusades, they would take up five days. Because, see, the people had traveled so far to be a part of what God was doing in their country that they didn't have anywhere else to go. They didn't have anything else to do. They had traveled the distance. They, they actually, cities would be set up. And when they were in these, in these crusades, these people, and they, just, they just kept handing the microphone. So when they're on the stage, it's just 24-7 preaching because they didn't know what else to do. Just hand the microphone. The next person in line, people just stand there. Yeah, all excited about the Word of God. They put their priorities to this is God time. I'm not going anywhere. I've got nothing to do. I'm here. I'm focused. Because we've got to set ourselves in order here. We need to be that hungry nation. We're not hungry enough at times. We're not, we're, we're, for some reason, we're full because we're filling ourselves up with nonsense. We're filling ourselves up with things that aren't of God. I'll, I'll take people hiking on and multiple trips and, and multiple people and trips and Tom and I will be hiking with these individuals and we'll get out and we know we need to get back down and help them out with their backpacks and give them some fresh water. We, we need to do these things. We'll come down. We've come across all different circumstances and cases where people will be either crying, they'll be pain, they're in pain, they're laying on the ground and they're, they're like, please take my pack. We'll take the load off of them. We'll walk the rest of the way out. We'll give them fresh water, and they're so excited. But I've been down there one time where I was struggling, and I needed someone to take my pack, and I was with a few other guys, and, and all of a sudden, these other two guys that came out earlier than us, they were coming down with refreshments, and they handed us a Sierra Mist. And I was like, what's wrong with you guys? Sierra Mist? And so the one guy was like, yes, he cracked it open, started chugging it, and then before you know it, his body was chugging it back out, like immediately. He's giving us the wrong stuff. He was giving us all the wrong things. Everyone's like, man, we do this time and time again with our daily walk. We allow this silly stuff to come in. We allow these crazy antidotes that we've made up in our head. We've Google searched it, how to deal with depression. 
how to deal with disease, how to deal with circumstances with your friends, your family, all these different things. The bottom line is the Bible gives you an example for everything, an antidote for all of it. He gives you the perfect, the perfect, perfect medicine. And that's the Holy Spirit. He tells you in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, he says, Be baptized. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. When you're filled with that Holy Spirit, it's power. And when you have that power, you're able to do everything, all things. All you have to do is just ask for the Holy Spirit to come in. Isn't that crazy that it's that easy? It's not even complicated. It's not like we need to do some like wavy, weird dance and now you get the Holy Spirit. It's actually just asking, hey God, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, oh you do? Yeah, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Pow! You have that ability right here at your fingertips. What's holding you back? Is there something inside of you that's hindering your growth? Is there something inside of you that's causing you to go, I'm not good enough? Stop looking at your scratches and dents. Stop saying you're not good enough. Are you still able to breathe? Yeah. Am I still able to walk? Yeah. That's all you've got to do. Stop looking at your imperfections. Stop focusing on all the issues at hand and start looking at what God's got for you. Stop making a picket sign to fight someone else. Put all your effort into the glory of God. Put all your effort into doing what's, what God has called you to do. He tells you through tests and tribulation and trials and things, count it all joy. Be excited about the Word of God. Be excited about what's at hand. You get to ask God for wisdom. You get to have faith. Build it up. And as you build that faith up, man, guess what happens? You're going to be, you're going to be on a placement, on a path that's so straight, that's so good, that God's going to use you. And you're going to look back and you go, man, do you see what God's been doing in my life? That's what Tony was, he was, man, he was celebrating with all of us men. Hey, God's changing my life, my family. What I thought was what I had to be as a dad is not what I have to be. I get to choose this day to follow the Lord and to worship Him. I'm making a covenant with Him so that I can take my son back to the beginning when Joshua crossed over into the promised land. They gathered stones and they made an altar and they said at this very moment, when we get older, we can ask, when our sons will ask us, hey, what were these about? We can tell them this was the promise that God made with us. That when we pro crossed in this promised land, that this was our land. And so that's what Tony's done with his family. He's taken that stone and he's placed it and he's saying, this is that moment. I'm crossing over to the promised land. And I will remind my son, this is where we started. This was the beginning. And now we don't have to go back. We don't go back into slavery. We don't have to go back into sickness and disease, but we can move forward. So guys, place your stone in the promised land. Build your altar and say, this is it. This is the moment. I'm here with God forever. I'm not going back. I'm, I'm doing this work. Start prioritizing your moments with God. Stop, stop with the nonsense of what this what this God-forsaken world is giving us. Stop looking at all of the sickness and disease and thinking it's overwhelming. Stop worrying about your finances and this world seeing your covenant, with, your, your covenant with God that He's made with you, Jesus Christ. That's what's going to change this world. That's what's making the difference. Let's pray.